Thank you, Joe. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here with you today. As you already heard, my name is Stef de Hecht. I'm a professor of anesthesiology at the Ghent University Hospital, and I'm very proud to serve as president of the European Society of Anesthesiology for the upcoming two years. This meeting is for me a great opportunity to share with all of you some of the contributions anesthesiology, my specialty, anesthesiology, and for the different societies of anesthesiologists have made to uh, patient safety, and more specifically, perioperative patient safety. Indeed, anesthesiology is not just about putting patients to sleep. Anesthesiologists actually are key players in perioperative patient safety. Okay. Just to give you a number, uh, a few numbers, thanks to our continuing efforts, we were capable of reducing mortality related to anesthesia, to anesthetic events by 97%. We are about at three in 100,000 in the 1950s, and now we are about at one in a million. And this is a tremendous advance in patient safety. And why has this occurred? Well, I will quote here the Helsinki Declaration on Patient Safety in Anesthesiology. This is because anesthesiologists safeguard the patient's best interest whenever they are at the most vulnerable period, be it in anesthesia, intensive care, medicine, pain, or critical emergency medicine. And these are the things we are dealing with as anesthesiologists. If I ask you the question, what does an anesthesiologist do? The first thing you will probably think about is putting patients asleep and hopefully getting the patients awake again. This is of course true. This is part of the job. But I hope to convince you that we do much, much more than just putting patients asleep. That's one part. We are also very much involved in the preoperative period. This means a period before anesthesia. We look at the patients, we discuss with the patients, and based on the entire picture, the physical condition of the patient, the circumstances where the patients live, we develop an anesthetic strategy, a perioperative strategy that will make sure that this patient has the safest procedure that one can imagine and deserve, of course. And even more important, we are also responsible for the postoperative phase. The trajectory is not finished after that the patient has gone, undergone surgery and has waken up. There is a whole period, at least 24 to 48 hours, where we need to take control of the patient. I will show you a few examples later on where you will see that this is a very important part of our uh, profession as anesthesiologists. But let's start with the um, intraoperative phase, the phase of the operation and the anesthesia, anesthesia itself. Let me tell you a brief story of a young guy that came in our day clinic a few months ago. Let's call him Mr. F. Mr. F is a 30-year-old male who suffers from a condition which we call chronic hydranitis superativa, which means that there are separating boils in his skin and they need to be removed. Mr. F has already undergone this operation a few times before, so we can know his condition. And you might uh, be interested to know that Mr. K, uh, Mr. F has become the proud father of a little girl two weeks before, and he has also another child, a two year and a half boy. So here is this young guy, father of two children, happy at home, and he comes in the operating theater for what we call a completely routine uh, operation. Everything goes smoothly, there are no delays, so from an administrative point of view, we are completely clear for a routine operation without any problems, takeoff, landing without any problems. So the guy, the man, is brought in the operating theater where the attending anesthesiological team is waiting for him. The attending anesthesiology team is myself, a supervising anesthesiologist, a young trainee, third year, so he's already capable of doing things, and the nurse assistant. Of note, the nurse had already been uh, present at two previous operations of um, Mr. F, so she knows a patient and they uh, dis uh, discuss with each other, talk with each other. We do the preoperative checklist, 
nothing wrong to see, everything is okay, and we start the induction. Because it's a routine case, I tell my assistant, my trainee, it's good, you're capable of doing it, I, uh, I leave it up to you, and I will be uh, here uh, looking at you and uh, sitting next to you, and it starts. Give the injection, what we expect, all to be normal, and then almost immediately, after the administration of the anesthetic drugs, Mr. F develops big, big problems. And because if Mr. F develops problems, this means that we as anesthesiological team are also in trouble. What is happening? He starts to convulse. His blood pressure drops. There is nothing we can imagine what happened. We use completely the same drugs as uh, have been used before. So we rule more or less out an allergic reaction to these drugs. But what is the cause? Is it a cardiac arrest? Possibly. But the problem is that because of convulsions, we cannot rely on the, on, the, on the monitoring, on the blood pressure, on the ECG, on the pulse oximeter. So we really don't know what is happening. And here you are with a complete anesthetic team dealing with a catastrophe in this young man without knowing what to do, so-called without knowing what is the cause. Well, luckily for us, we have, uh, thanks to the uh, anesthesiological societies, we have guidelines, we have sending operating procedures. Here you see an example of such an algorithm that helps you to uh, react to uh, such situation, even complete unexpected situation. You just follow the situations, uh, you just follow the, the guidelines and you know what to do. And here, that's what we did. What is the first direction in the guidelines? It say, call for help. And that's what we did. Call for help and then we started the resuscitation. Now, I will leave you the story uh, of Mr. F for a few minutes and tell you later on what happened with him. What do I want to underscore with this example? Well, no matter how many times you check and you recheck the, uh, the equipment, the condition of the patient, it's not, you can never exclude that at a certain moment, a complete routine scenario turns out into a disaster scenario. Some people like to compare what is happening in anesthesia with what is happening in the aviation industry. That's okay. We know that from the aviation industry, the introduction of a very rigorous checklist have resulted in a dramatic decrease in uh, airplane crashes and airplane accidents. And actually, we do more or less the same. We have our checklist. We control everything, and we can diminish the incidents occurring by uh, wrong medication, by equipment failure, and so on. But what people tend to uh, forget is that a patient is not a machine. Biological systems are infinitely more complicated and more unpredictable than machines, than planes. So you cannot uh, make the entire uh, parallel with, uh, with the aviation industry. Okay. You know that we are dealing with uh, perioperative um, problems. And anesthesiologists, by definition, are trained, we are really uh, very well trained to deal with these acute catastrophes uh, in, uh, in, uh, during the operation and during uh, surgery. The problem is that this knowledge of a catastrophe that hangs above you uh, is present is an important psychological burden to the um, to the entire team. And therefore, it's very important that the team, but also the patient, and also the uh, relatives of the patient know that anesthesiologists are trained doctors, and that the anesthesiology team is a trained team. So they are capable of dealing with all potential catastrophes. Now, let me go back, sorry. Let me go back to Mr. F. What is the thing you probably remind you of Mr. F? For all the details I have given you. Probably the whole sole thing that you uh, remember is the fact that he's a young father of two children. This gives some kind of recognizability, not also for you, but also for the team that is dealing with Mr. Uh, F. You need to take into account that my nurse and my assistant had the same age, 
So for them, it's a really psychological burden to see that this guy is developing problems. They could be in the same situation. They can easily imagine that they are in the same situation. This is a kind of very uh, important psychological burden. And then again, it's good to know that you have a trained anesthesiologist with uh, years and years of uh, experience uh, under his belts. So at this stage, you might be interested to know what an anesthesiology team is, what an anesthesia team is. Well, at least in Europe, they mostly consist of such teams uh, with a physician anesthesiologist, trained physician anesthesiologist, sometimes a trainee, if you are in the situation of an education hospital, and an assistant, always, almost always an assistant, be it a nurse or a technician. Now, what does this anesthesiological team do? The role is, first of all, to evaluate the patient. Before you start, or before we start the operation, the anesthesia, we know the patient. We know all the uh, medical history of the patients. We know the diseases of the patients, the medication, and so on. Based on this information, a uh, strategic plan is developed and is administered during the operation. And after the operation, of course, there is a comp uh, continuous diagnosis, monitoring of the patient to prevent any problems to occur, or if they occur, to treat them as good as possible. So you have this team. This team is, of course, very good to treat the patients, but it also is a unique opportunity to give education and training to the next generation of anesthesiologists. We will not live forever. After us, there need to be anesthesia also. So we train these anesthesiologists. And you need to know that anesthesiology, training to anesthesiology is rather arduous and uh, takes a long time. People really need the training. And the training is given by us, senior anesthesiologists, who have thousands and thousands of anesthesias under, uh, under our belt. But in addition to this training, to this demonstration on how to work, to this education bit to, uh, at bedside, there is also need for continuous medical education. We need to be sure that our colleagues remain up to date that they know the recent advances, that they know about recent uh, uh, changes and uh, adaptations. And there is a place where anesthesiological societies can play an important role, not can play, play indeed a very important role. Perhaps you are now wondering what a professional scientific society could be. Well, let me give you an example close by, which is our society, the European Society of Anesthesiology. What is our task, generally, is to promote and coordinate the scientific, educational, and professional activities across Europe, and this in order to continually improve, this is the important point, improve the standards of practice, and as a consequence, improve patient safety. There are several pillars by which we can do this. One of the pillars is research. We develop our own clinical studies, we administer research grants. Um, we publish the results of our studies in different publications, in different scientific papers, among others, our own uh, journal, the European Journal of Anesthesiology. We disseminate the knowledge to all our members all over the world uh, via um, the website, via the newsletter, and so on. Another important part part of a scientific society is to give an education, to provide a tool to the members to give, to uh, continue, to have continuing medical education by e-learning, for instance, simulation classes, master classes, and so on. And a very important also, and I uh, already mentioned this, is the production of guidelines. Guidelines help the individual doctors to know how to treat, uh, with, uh, how to treat the different uh, issues that may occur. Let's go back for a minute to the case of Mr. F. What Mr. F developed was a very rare condition. So rare that a lot of anesthesiologists will never encounter this in their daily professional life. 
So they cannot rely on own experience. They need to rely on standing orders that are given in, uh, by, the, by the scientific societies. And it's thanks to these guidelines, the following of these standard operating procedures, that people, persons like Mr. F, for instance, can survive a disaster like what's happening in uh, the case. I will come back to Mr. F later on. What I want to do now is to give you a little uh, story to demonstrate you that our role as anesthesiologists goes beyond the intraoperative phase. We are also responsible for the preoperative and the postoperative period, like as I already said before. The case I want to, uh, uh, to um, give you is uh, the case of Mrs. K. Mrs. K is an 80-year-old lady who needs to undergo a second hip replacement because of arthrosis. She's scheduled for an elective operation. She lives together with her husband, but the husband has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease a few months ago. So actually, she's the one who needs to take care of her husband. The couple is capable of still living at home. They have some domestic help, some social help twice a week, but they can live more or less independently at home. They have a daughter living abroad, so not available, and there are also no other relatives to take care of them or to help them if there is a problem. Like almost all persons of about 80 years, Mrs. K has some additional comorbidities, other diseases that are present. She's hypertensive, she has type 2 diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, and because of all these conditions, she needs to take a lot of medication, what we call polypharmacy. So Mrs. K, even if she's independent uh, living, she is still a rather per, uh, person which is uh, significantly at risk. And because of this, the increased risk and the age of the patient, she's uh, referred to the preoperative anesthesiology clinic. And what does she see? Do we see there? Mrs. K has also an additional problem, which is anemia not sufficient red blood cells. This makes this elective operation very dangerous, even more dangerous than it's normal. We don't want to operate an old lady for a hip, fracture, for a hip replacement when she's anemic. So the anesthesiologist takes a very wise decision, says, I will postpone this operation for six weeks and we will try to optimize Mrs. K by giving her some iron, um, to, uh, to increase uh, the red blood cell count. This is done. After six weeks, it appears that, uh, um, it appears that the blood tests are completely normal and Mrs. K gets her operation without any problem. Sorry about that. So Mrs. K uh, gets her operation. And now I want you to imagine two different scenarios. Think about it as a DVD game where you have, depending on the circumstances, a complete different outcome when you have uh, uh, different uh, circumstances. So in the first universum, let's say, Mrs. K is admitted in a high care hospital. This high care hospital has a facilities for continuous monitoring, has a facilities of sufficient staff, so Mrs. K is controlled after the operation, uh, very, is very closely controlled and very closely monitored. Now, in the middle of the night, Mrs. K develops bleeding, heavy bleeding at the level of the operation wound. What happens? She starts to bleed, she gets hypotensive, saturation decreases, and the consequence is, because she's monitored, that the monitors go in alarm. Immediately, there is the attending staff. Mrs. K is treated promptly, and there is no problem at all. Everything is okay. She can leave the ward the day after and the hospital a week, a week later back to her husband to take care of him. Now imagine an alternative parallel universe where Mrs. K is not in the high care hospital, but she's in a low care hospital. This hospital or this situation has no resources or very little resources. No money for monitoring, no money for staff, and there, Mrs. K, after the operation, goes immediately to the ward, develops the same story. In the middle of the night, she starts to bleed, gets hypotensive, 
get hypoxic, but now nobody uh, sees it. There is no monitoring. It's only the morning after, when the nurse is around, that she discovered that Mrs. K is in big trouble. At that time, she's completely exsanguinated, and she needs resuscitation. She's resuscitated, brought to the intensive care unit, where unfortunately, she develops a pneumonia due to an uh, antibiotics-resistant uh, strain. And she lingers between life and death for weeks and weeks. So, what do I want to prove? Or what do, what do I want to underscore with uh, this example? First of all, preoperatively, there is the importance of the highly tailored uh, care. I've shown you that Mrs. K has a lot of comorbidities and that these comorbidities need to be taken into account. We decided to postpone the operation to optimize her, uh, her blood count, to prevent any transfusion to, uh, to occur. So this is an active action taken by an anesthesiologist. But Mrs. K is not only Mrs. K as a patient. She lives together with her husband, and her husband depends on her. So the longer Mrs. K is absent from home, the more strain this will put on our familial and social situation, and certainly the situation of Mr. K. So we need to take into account that certainly for so, uh, this type of persons, we need to make the hospital stay as short as possible. What is the second message I want to give you? There is an absolute need for appropriate human and financial resources. You have seen in the high care hospital, Mrs. K is promptly treated and there is no complication afterwards. In the low care hospital, if we cannot monitor our patients, if we cannot treat our patients, there is a big problem because these patients will die or at least develop important uh, morbidities. So, you might be curious to know what happened with the uh, two patients I presented to you. Well, Mr. F, Mr. F survived. He was diagnosed. Uh, we resuscitated him successfully, and apparently, the, from the clinical, um, the clinical picture and the blood uh, values, it appeared that he has developed an anaphylactic shock. So he had the fourth time that the medication was used, he had developed at one of the agents that we use an anaphylactic shock. He could leave the hospital the day after and is living happy with his family and with his two children. What happened to Mrs. K? Well, Mrs. K is a little bit a composite character. You have seen that the outcome of Mrs. K critically depends, and of patients like Mrs. K, critically depends on the resources that are present to treat, to monitor, and to follow these patients. So I come back to my initial point. What is the role of anesthesiologists in perioperative safety, in perioperative patient safety? Well, I hope I have convinced you that we play a role preoperatively, intraoperatively, and postoperatively. And it is this integrated approach that makes it possible for us as anesthesiologists to take care of the patients and to give the patients a safe perioperative course. And societies try to uh, continue to even improve this patient safety by working together with other anesthesiological societies, other anesthesiology group, healthcare professionals, institutions, patient associations, and with you, the public. And it's only in this way that we are capable of improving perioperative patient safety for the sake of all our future patients. Thank you very, very much.